أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقلقوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأنيبوا إلى ربكم وأسلموا له من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب ثم لا تنصرون واتبعوا أحسن ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب أن يأتيكم العذاب بغتة وأنتم لا تشعرون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما بعد All praises due to Allah <coughs> And we ask Allah to exalt the mansion and grant peace and send his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم upon his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the end of time. Uh, talking about oneself is uh, a slippery slope. And uh, it could easily be done uh, out of vanity and uh, conceit and uh, egotism and things of the sort, which we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us from and we seek refuge with him from that kind of uh, intention or that kind of mentality. Um, but um, the niya is really the fine line in these issues. Um, the fundamental principle is that one does not speak about oneself unless there's a benefit in doing so. There's a benefit. Not um, not one where it's 50-50. It should be, the benefit should outweigh the harm. Specifically when we deal with issues wherein someone will speak of their past and that past was sinful. It, was, uh, it included many sins and many different acts of disobedience, perhaps disbelief, huh? rejection of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala altogether. Um, which, which is a very sensitive issue. So unless the benefit outweighs the harm, such issues should not be addressed. Um, however, tonight, after consulting particular people of knowledge, and uh, while recognizing the difference of opinion among the ulama in regards to this, um, tonight you will hear the story of the helpless slave of Allah which is myself. Now, I'm not a storyteller, and so this is not something that is habitual or that should be done often, nor is this the da'wah that we call people to, where we just are storytellers telling people stories, because that is usually criticized. But um, at times, stories have benefits. As Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ In their stories, there was a Reminder, there was a lesson for the people of intellect. And the Prophet ﷺ would often narrate to a Sahaba or he would deliver a, a wisdom through a narrative, through a story that happened before. And so there's a wisdom behind it. There's a wisdom behind it. And the reason why 
we will be having this particular discussion this evening is for three things. There are three reasons why I chose to do it. Even though people have asked before, but there was some reluctance. The first reason that it was done in Arabic, and then the people said, well, we don't understand Arabic, so what happened in that? So I said, okay, that's not fair. The second reason is to show you Allah's mercy, the manifestation of Allah's mercy in one's life. So that no one despairs from the mercy of Allah. And that is probably the most important lesson. To see how merciful is Allah. Because sometimes we fail in recognizing that. We fail in recognizing that. Specifically, those of us who may be in some predicament or some uh, stage in their life where all the door seems to be closed and it seems that nothing is happening the way you want it to happen. And you reach that state of despair, which is forbidden then you realize that Allah's mercy is there. And you will see throughout the story how often that happened. The third reason is to speak of Allah's favors. It's all the favors of Allah. And this is the, this is the theme. What I will be mentioning, Wallahi, is not because of me. I know of myself what you don't know, and alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah that Allah conceals the sins of the slave and he keeps him, you know, personal to the person because if everything were to be exposed, probably we would not be sitting with each other. So it is not because I have some special traits or special qualities. La, la I know myself enough to know that I'm not entitled to that. But it is the mercy of Allah. It is the favor of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I'm the helpless. We should all be the helpless slaves of Allah. No one should think that he has done something because of his own accomplishments. That is Qarun mentality. Qarun. And Allah Azza wa Jal made the earth swallow him when he thought that he made the money by himself. It was Allah Azza wa Jal who gave it to him. Thirdly, it will not be merely a narrative where you hear someone's story say, oh, nice. No, 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 no. I made it a point that at every at every milestone, at every segment, where there's some issue of clarification that is Islamic, it will be addressed. And you will see what I'm talking about as we start. Meaning, as I go on with the story, as I narrate the story to you, inshallah, there will be points where you will say, okay, that's what happened, and that's what Islam says, and that's where I was wrong, or that's how, whatever. So we will learn, we will learn from the actual story, rather than simply hear a story. Otherwise, you have the right to leave because it's not the most entertaining thing in the world. Some may think otherwise. Now, of course, uh, there's a fatwa by our beloved Sheikh, Sheikh Fawzan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. And uh, the fatwa of the Sheikh is that you should not speak of your previous sins, if Allah, even for da'wah purposes. However, our other Sheikh, Hafizahullah, Sheikh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al Abbad, said, as it relates to sharing his story, he's speaking about our brother Napoleon. Probably know him, Muta. Uh, that was a fatwa for him. Being a means of publicizing his sins, this is not the case. Huh? The story being means of publicizing the sins, which is forbidden in Islam. This is not the case. Rather, he should not speak about what he did in the past in much detail. Nor should he speak about it in a manner of glorification. And this is very important. When we speak about some sins... No one, none of the youth are allowed to say, well, let me try it. Let me try it because he tried it and now he's guided, Allah will guide me. No. From now I'm telling you, whatever, that, whatever happened, it was wrong, it remains to be wrong. And I will give you some examples as we go along. He said, uh, we have books which contain the biographies of the Salaf, some detailing who and what they were prior to Islam. So how did we get this information except that they exposed some of it? As it is means of education, not as means of entertainment and glorification. And that is the niya tonight, insha'Allah. One vivid example of this is the story of the Salaf by the name Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad, which you should know. Rahimahullah, who was on his way to commit zina. He was on his way to commit fornication with a woman. And in the process of climbing the wall to her house for that purpose, he overheard some of the Muslims performing salah, and in the salah, the person was reciting the ayah, has not the time come that the hearts of the believers tremble with fear for the remembrance of Allah, and, uh, and what he has revealed of the truth, 
And so that was a reminder for him and he changed his mind and he became who he is. Al-Fudayl rahimahullah which we quote until today. So he said he was on his way to commit zina wal ayyadu billah. But there was a, a lesson behind it. So how did we get that story from the Salaf had that not been permissible at all times? Um, this is, and the, the Sheikh continues to say, some of the scholars differed on this matter, but the position that I incline towards is the position of the major scholars that came before me, namely Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, and Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahumullah. That it, if, if it is for the purpose of spreading Islam, then we should take advantage of it and not leave it as an empty void to be filled with the people of desires and innovations. Okay? So there's an, it's an educational story, not one of entertainment. Even though there may be some elements of entertainment, because some crazy things happen, I'll tell you that much. But that is not the objective. The objective is we learn so that we don't fall into the same trap that I fell into. And that we can educate others about the consequences of things which we have taken lightly. And you will see many examples of that inshallah. So let us begin. Huh? Allah al-musta'an wa alayhi tuklan wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Uh, my name is Wajdi Akkari, uh, aka also known as Abu Mus'ab, because my son's name is Mus'ab. And I'm Lebanese, uh, born in Lebanon in the year 1980 and 1400 Hijri. Um, uh, basically, we, I was born to a family that did not really have Islam anywhere except on our passport. The only place Islam had a slot in our lifestyle was the what we call in Lebanon is Akhraj al Eid. Okay, it's just like a, a hawiya, it's like a form of ID. However, we were uh, pretty much Christians in practice, Muslims in name. Even the name, by the way, my family member's name is not really Mus is Islamic, but mine is somewhere in between. So we would have all the Christmas celebrations with no exception, except we, in fact, we exceeded Christians. We used to have a Christmas tree in our house and my father would hire a Santa Claus who would drop off a gift at midnight. I would see it with my own eyes. I don't think Christians did that. They didn't go to that extreme. I mean, it was just a Christmas. We were full-fledged uh, uh, Christian in a sense that in, a, in Lebanon, specifically back then, there was this kind of uh, no, no distinction between Muslim and Christian. You would not be able to tell. And speaking about it was an insult. To ask someone, you know, you're Muslim or Christian, it was an insult. These matters weren't discussed even though there was a civil war. So uh, there was no Islam really. And I, was, I used to go to a French school, so I spoke French. Un peu de français. J'oubliais le français. Now it's all evaporated with the son of Jeddah. Uh, there, was some, there are a few sentences left that I still use. People think I speak French. I don't speak French. However, I used to attend a French school. And I spoke French fluently. I had a cousin. His name is Uthman. And uh, we, were, we were best friends. He was uh, uh, my aunt's son. He's my nephew. I'm sorry. My nephew? My, my aunt's son. And my, he's my maternal aunt cousin. Yeah, he's my cousin. Yeah, cuz. Anywho, he was a funny guy. Whenever we would race, I would always beat him. And he used to say, it's because your shoes are faster than mine. He would blame my shoes, that my shoes were better than his. So we were very good friends. Now, my, uh, her, his father passed away. Rahimahullah. He was a Muslim, alhamdulillah. And when he passed away, my aunt migrated, as they call it there in Lebanon, to the States. America. Now, before her, my other uncle and my other aunt had already gone there. They've already become Americans in the whole nine yards. So when she went over there, he went with her or he stayed behind by himself. He went along. And all of a sudden, I don't have a friend. And so I told my mom at a very young age, how come he gets to go and I don't get to go? And my mom said, no problem. Finish school and go. I said, okay. So she actually took me out of French school and enrolled me in an English school. An international school in Batrumin al Kura. It's called international school, and it was an international school. Religion was not allowed to be discussed. You could not discuss religion, talk about salah, not that I cared anyways. But just so you would know, it was a secular, secular school. And so now, 
you can imagine I'm a young boy, and in my mind, one day, I'm going to do what I see on TV. I'm watching Hollywood, I'm watching movies, you know, and it's like, you know how they make it look fascinating. It's just so fascinating. It's like, wow. You know, the way the people walk on the street and all the cool people, it's like, one day, huh? One day. So I said to myself, I'm going to prepare myself so that when I go, I don't want to feel like a foreigner. Okay? I want to go there and feel like I've been there all my life. So I needed to make some preparation, which I did. How did that happen? It happened through two things, namely basketball and rap, music in general. Of course, in the beginning, it was the lay music of the, you know, disco and the, the stuff of the old, you know, the, the lousy, lousy songs, even until now. But it was the stages. Music was, of course, part and parcel of the life. The whole, my whole life was music. That's the only thing that mattered. So I'm MBA, I'm thinking one day, I look at Muggsy Bogus, I don't know if you know these names, you know, Spud Webb, all these short basketball players who made it to the NBA, and I'm like, I can do it. I mean, there are short people there. Some of them are shorter than myself. So there was a dream that one day I could make it to the NBA. Of course, I didn't make it to any NBA, alhamdulillah, for good reasons. And then, of course, the rap, the music, you know. Now, at 11, at the age of 11, my, of course I was a, a wild student in school. Not one that you want you to be right now. Because some people think that it's nice to be, you know, the, the wild one in class and the clown. But if you are the clown of the class, the first advice and the education and the story is don't be. Because you will regret it at some point in your life. I did. Anywho, my grandfather passed away. My mother's father, who was Turkish, passed away. Now, when he passed away, my mother, who had never had anything about Islam, like I told you, we had no Islam, it was a wake-up call for her. Okay? And she decided to return to Allah. When that happened, the environment in Lebanon was not one where the methodology of the Salaf was prevalent. It was grave worship and Sufism. And I remember as soon as Allah guided my mother in that sense, meaning guided her from nothing to something, the first thing we did was visited all the main qubur in Sham. Mind you, not only Lebanon, no, we went all the way to Syria and neighboring countries visiting the maqam of, you know, Fulan and Fulan and Fulan. I remember that clearly. We went on a journey visiting the awliya supposedly of Allah. And my mom, May Allah, you know, forgive her. Now, alhamdulillah, she's totally different. I will tell you later what happened. My mom bought one of these uh, uh, counters. Mind you, now, the Sabha has how many maximum? A hundred. The Sufi Sheikh, a hundred wasn't enough. It was in the thousands. She bought one of these, you know, click, click. You know, she, you click on it, and the numbers increase. And I can remember my mom sitting watching soap opera and doing the dhikr at the same time. It doesn't register really now. I'm thinking, Mom, what were you doing back then, you know? But the guy, when he tells you have to make 5,000, subhanallah, I mean, that's going to take the whole day. And so she would do it while she's cooking and while she's watching TV. I mean, everything was integrated. So that is now, my mom, when she got that kind of wake-up call, she wanted to influence the family, the people around her. My father didn't respond, uh, nor did my self. My sister was a little better. Um, I had an elder sister, an older sister. I was uh, a little tough. But then again, I couldn't really, my mom was not one who played games. If you know what I mean. Meaning you can say something nicely, and if you do it, uh, congratulations. If you don't do it, there are other means to make sure that you do it. So when these other means were applied, I started to pray for my mom. Not for Allah. Because my mom wanted me to pray. And I remember I would be playing football all day, soccer, play bicycle, whatever, whatever, causing, you know, havoc in the streets. And then we'd go home at the end, maybe 10 o'clock at night, and I would pray all the prayers in five minutes. You know, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. We call it Qada. Huh? Some call it Qaza. Call it what you want to call it. It doesn't exist in Islam. 
There's no such thing as you go play all day and then you want to pray everything as makeup. You cannot make up salah unless there's a valid reason you were having a surgery or something along these lines. Otherwise, you have to pray on time. We didn't have this mentality. So there you have it. Now during that time, my mother wanted me to learn the Quran. She enrolled me in a masjid. And that masjid, they used to have tahfid, a little different than the one you have here. But anyways, they tried to have us memorize Juzu Amma. And I think I got some of it before I eventually quit from this particular tahfid. And that is it. A couple of years went by. I became crazier, more, more attached to Tupac and Biggie Smalls and them people. And you know, the whole West Coast, East Coast warfare and, and rap. And then even the, the salah and everything and the khalas, even that, you know, make up the, all that disappeared. And I was approaching the time for graduation and actually getting the chance to leave. So the last year of school, I took the TOEFL exam, enrolled in an, in a, in an institute and worked on my, my English was pretty good because I wanted English. English was necessary to get out there. Not because I was a studious student. Um, and so I got, my aunt applied for me in, in a university, CSUN, in, in California, Los Angeles, and I got uh, approved. Now I go there, I arrive, I remember my aunt and uncle, her husband, who you will hear a lot about soon, picked me up from the airport, and the first thing they did is took me to Hollywood. And I saw the first transvestite. I don't know if you know what that is. Okay, it's like a, a female male, like, or, or men that are women and women that are men, they're, they're like actually men who, are, who become women, dressed like women, skirt, and you know, they have hair, long hair. And so you, you, someone will speak to him thinking it's a her, and then he will tell him that he's a man. Said, look, I was like, wow, you know, this is real. These are people walking down the street. And they took me to uh, McDonald's, I think, and they got me a couple of burgers, which I didn't like. And then we went to their place. So we got a swimming pool outside and everything. I'm like, oh, this is unbelievable. I pick up the phone, start calling my friends in Lebanon. Guys, you won't believe this is crazy, man. This and that. I'm telling them everything. I run a bill of $1,000. $1,000 is 3,750 reals, more than my aunt and uncle may combined. I don't, I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. Of course, when the phone bill came, they went berserk. Said, what is this? I said, what? They said, how could you do this? You're this. And this was the first, the beginning of the conflict. And I was thinking in my mind, what are these money worshippers, man? This is my aunt? All this getting mad and upset because of a bill? Because I was spoiled. I didn't realize the value of money. And that's a lesson you need to learn. Especially if you're kids. You father, man, be working harder than you can imagine to make the money. And you think it's a picnic every time you see a toy, Baba, I want this. No, Habibi. The guy works hard, he has to listen to his boss, trashing him and telling him, come this and do this and everything to make the money. So you can just ask for it in a simple manner? No. Appreciate what your parents are doing. It's not easy to make money and then they spend it with love on you. But don't take advantage. Don't take advantage of their kindness. Know that they work hard. They must work hard to make money unless they're doing something wrong. Which hopefully nobody's like that. So anyways, the problem began. I go to school, okay? And uh, you can imagine what the campus would be like over there. And I start mixing with the people and everything and you know, and then here comes the tuition. The tuition was outrageous. The money, because a foreign student, was so much my dad could never even imagine to afford. So what was the advice I was given by everybody? Get married. So I'd get the green card, man, and then, you know, when you become a citizen, you can go back to school, it's going to be nice and cheap, you know, you can get a student loan, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, yeah, sure, no problem, we can do that. And so I go fetching for a wife. I found one. And she was a Buddhist. In the meantime, I'm going to school, I'm working on campus, they allow you to work part-time to make some money, and I'm working at a gas station on the weekend. And you don't want to work in a gas station. But you know, you work in a gas station where any day, any time someone can come up, put a gun in your head and rob you, shoot you and leave. You've probably seen some of these videos on YouTube. 
That's why they have fiberglass and thick glass for, for the, you know, the teller or whatever you want to call him, the, the clerk, because anytime they could lose their life, you're living in a land where guns speak and gangsters exist and people die all of a sudden because someone is not in a good mood. Alhamdulillah, we have some security here. I'm working in the gas station and I'm uh, waiting, I'm going to school. Now in the school, I met the wrong people. It wasn't long before we met the wrong people. That, so this is the lady that I'm supposed to be married to. Her brother, Tony, was a rapper. And he was part of a group called Scums of the Earth, who were really the scums of the earth. And so I said, this is perfect. This is perfect. That's all I've been looking for. So I'm going to become friends with him. He's Buddhist. The whole clan of rappers is Buddhist. Of course, they're from different backgrounds. White people, black people, Mexican people, from everything, from every background. So I'm with these guys, right? And now my life is, the rap, the rap thing is starting to develop. Now I have actually a platform. And I have people who have a studio at home. We have a complete studio with the turntables and the mixers and microphone and the closet for the sound quality and the whole nine yards. People making beats all day, that was our life. I started hanging out with the guys, they have Buddhist practices. Now in the beginning when I first met them, the lady, her mother and her brother, I was actually trying to give them dawah. To believe in Allah. Didn't have anything, but I was trying to debate with them in the beginning, like what are you people, it's a weird belief. But because I didn't have any foundation, I lost the battle and they won me over. They bribed me. Okay? And be careful of being bribed. Someone will offer you some dunya to give up your deen. I was like that. I started practicing their practices just to be harmonious with them. So we would practice what is known as chanting, where we would sit behind what they call a butsinan, and it's like a bookshelf with some signatures of their mashayikh. And we would sit like this and say, Nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo. If they hear this, they're going to laugh. Say, what in the world is nam yo ho renge kyo? You ask me, I tell you, I don't know. I must have said it over 10 million times in my life, but I never knew what it meant. All I knew was, this is supposed to change your karma, because they believed in reincarnation. It will change your karma, so you do that and you're going to get yourself, when you die, come back in a better condition than now. Huh? So if you're evil, you're putting out evil in the world, they expect that you should receive evil according to the karma rule, cause and effect, cause and effect. If you chant, you're able to change your karma so that you don't get evil, you get good instead. So you don't, if you die, you don't come back as a cockroach or as a rat, you come back as a king or a president. Foolish, but true. And I would go with them to the temple. Now, of course, the Buddhists in America are not like the Buddhists in other countries like Sri Lanka and what have you. Because there are de denominations of Buddhism. These were people who everything was halal for them. Even the idea of asceticism and, you know, uh, depriving oneself of pleasure, that didn't exist. They were having barbecues all day, getting high all night, and just, you know, people would go there to meet each other. Anyways, these are the people I'm hanging out with. Now, the problem started to happen at home with my aunt and her husband. Because I was such a troublemaker, I started bringing trouble into the house. And they could not tolerate it anymore. And so I said, you know what, I don't need you guys anyways, I'm going to move out on my own. I got a job at a, as a waiter at a restaurant, Denny's restaurant, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And you make money. I made money, at least. Because, you know, being a waiter requires that you, you know, you treat your customers a particular way. And I liked it. I liked to be, a, to provide service. I was a service provider. So I used to make a lot of money every night, and so I rented my own apartment, and I bought my own car, a Ford Mustang, four-cylinder, not the big one with the big engine, it was the fake one, it looked like it was a real sports car, but it had one of the smallest engines in the world, so don't be fooled by the hype. Anyways, now when I bought this, my other aunt, Uthman's mother, took me to a man. His name is Hisham. Hisham was an insurance salesman, had an insurance agency. And so over there, you have to have insurance to register the car in your name, okay? 
I bought the insurance. Now you pay the down payment for the, then they get the policy, and then you pay the rest in installments. I gave him the down payment, then I escaped. I didn't like the guy from the moment I met him, so I said, you know what, this guy doesn't even deserve my money. I'm just gonna give him the down payment, get the policy, and run. And I did, I wouldn't pay him. They would send me letters of notification, you're due, your payment is due. I would look at it, rip it and throw it in the trash, yalla. Why? I know that he will not remove the insurance because of my aunt. He, will, he, will, he could, if he wants, he could deactivate the policy because I didn't pay. But for my aunt, I knew that he would let it run and I would benefit from it, so I didn't make any payments. But anyways, we started with each other on the wrong foot. From the beginning, me and this guy did not really get along very well. I thought he was just this arrogant prick, you know. So what is this guy? Thinks he's a special guy, you know, has his office and all this, the way he talked to me. And I thought that I was the, the coolest person in the world. I had such intellect. Yeah, and what are these dumb people around me? And this is one of the tricks of the shaitan. When he makes you feel that you know what's going on and everybody else doesn't. And I'm not talking about matters of religion, but in matters of the dunya, very often everybody knows what's up and you don't. Like what happened to me. I thought I knew. Now I know that I didn't know anything. I was a jahil. Real jahil in the dunya. Because I, I was treating the people bad thinking I'm smart. But it's going to come back to you. See, it will come back to you. Things Bye. are starting to go in all kinds of directions. Have the car, living the whole rap Then lifestyle. I moved to New York. Because that lady who became my wife, when she was accepted in the university in New York, I had to go along. And I moved to New York, Staten Island, I'm there in New York, New York, I'm still trying to do the whole rap thing and trying to continue my crazy life. And this is when September 11 happened, which I told you I saw with my own eyes, but there was no Islam there in my life. Of course, you can go to the lecture that happened in Malaysia, uh, the messenger and the message. I, I discussed the issue of what the whole event of, of September 11 and where I was and what happened in the news, which were in the streets and whatever. Eventually, here now there's going to be the change, okay? I'm, I'm living off this lady. I don't have a job. I'm a loser. I'm a potato, as they say. Just, you know, all day playing game called Worms. There's this Worms game, Worms Armageddon, Worms 1, Worms 2. That was my whole life. Video games, entertainment, and, you know, rap and everything. Nothing else of any important significance. But the situation got bad even with the lady. We started differing on major issues, you know, you don't pay rent, you don't do anything, you need to get out of here. And so I said, okay, I was kicked out. Kicked out, went back to Los Angeles. To live with who? Her brother Tony and the seven scums of the earth who all lived in one big apartment. They had seven or eight rooms, each one had rented his own room, they paid the rent, joint rent. I moved back, I'm... I'm in the worst, you see, do I look skinny now? I was four times skinnier than now. Can you imagine, I was, as they say, I was clothes were walking. Any minute, I will disappear. And I had a big old afro, like a broom. You know, if ever you needed to, you know, broom the, clean the, the thing, my hair was perfect. People used to think I'm wearing a wig. You know, they would grab my hair and pull it and say, hey, it's my hair, man, I'm not wearing a wig. He said, it doesn't, it doesn't look like you would have curly hair. Whatever. Now I'm bald all the time, you don't know that. And I'm in a very bad condition. I have no fulus. No fulus whatsoever. I'm, I'm on wood. I'm on metal. I'm, I'm on the floor. I come back and the guy said, look, there's a room available for you, man, but you have to pay the rent. He said, well, let me, let me just stay there for now and then I'll figure out the rent. I now, my relationship with my parents is whacked out. Okay, my mom and dad, I don't call them, I don't waste money, because it's a lot of money to speak to Lebanon from, from the States. International phone calls, I don't bother calling them. And they already hate me, I have problems I'm with my mom. I'm in a no money, nothing. The only person that still kind of speaks to me is my aunt, Uthman's mother. I call her up, say, listen, I came back from New York, I don't, no money, nobody lends me any money. They know if they lend me money, they're not going to see it again. Okay, so my family had learned a lesson. 
uh, this and that said, you know, I'm going applying at all kinds of jobs. I had already worked so many different things. I was a mechanic cleaning, you know, changing oil, changing brakes on cars, cleaning the floor. In restaurants, obviously, you have to clean up after people. It is all kinds of jobs, telemarketing, whatever. So I go to Albertsons, all these places, apply to be a bagger, not a beggar. You know the bagger? The one who stands like right now at Danube and just puts the stuff in the bag just so you can take it and go give him a tip. They wouldn't hire me. I call my aunt and say, listen, I'm in deep trouble and uh, there's no, no place to go. I had reached a point in my life, I, I hate life, I hate what's happening. I try to do the whole Hollywood thing and it didn't work out very well. You know, and it's just it's not, really, not really cool. She said, why don't you call Hisham? I said, Hisham? The guy who I bought insurance from. I said, no, 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 not that guy. She said, you don't have anybody else. So I said, okay, I'll call Hisham. Call Hisham, you know, marhaba Hisham, trying to give him some Lebanese. Uh, you know, um, you know, remember me? <laughs> well, you know, the situation is, you know, I need, I need to talk to you and everything, need a job. I said, come, come to the office. It's on Ventura Boulevard. I go over there. I walk in on him with my wild looking appearance. He looks at me like this, like, what happened to this guy? I said, well, look, man, you know, I need a job and everything, and I haven't been able to find anything. And he said, okay, what can you do? I said, anything. He said, can you sell insurance on the phone? I said, oh, yeah, man, telemarketing. I sold ink cartridges. I sold long-distance services, whatever you want. I, I used it. I've done it. Yeah, yeah, I'll sell insurance. You call small businesses, offer them insurance, better deal than the one they have, no problem. He said, okay, $5 an hour. $5 an hour. Alhamdulillah. I didn't say Alhamdulillah back then. Perfect. The guy hired me. I start working with him. Now, he, where I was living, was far from the office. But he would make it a point to drop me off. And his house was right next to his office. Okay? He doesn't have to. Two minutes he's home. He would drive me all the way to where I was living every day at the end of the shift. And then he told one of the secretaries to pick me up one day would come to work. So he arranged my pick up and drop off. I'm like, wow, this is nice. He gave me some money up front. He said, we'll deduct it from your salary as you go along, but you need to keep some money with you so you can pay the rent and take care of yourself. I said, hey, fantastic. man. I'm working, things are starting to get better. I have some money in my pocket. I feel some form of security. So then, what happened was, when he would pray, I started feeling ashamed of myself, in one sense, and, but the truth is I was like, this guy is a nice guy. And if I pray with him, he will love me more, and he will help me more. So let me pray. No wudu, nothing. In fact, I don't know when to say Subhana Rabbi al azim or Subhana Rabbi al Wallahi. I remember the first time I said, oh, what, what, in the ruku, what do I say? Is it Subhana Rabbi al Adim, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim? I couldn't remember and I'm too ashamed to ask. Can I ask someone? He prays, I stand with him and I move along with him. Nifaqan. Hypocrisy. Because I'm trying to be on good terms with the boss. The boss is being nice. When he saw me pray with him, he said, well, come to Jumu'ah. Because before he would go to Jumu'ah, leave me behind at work. Friday is not a holiday there. So when he saw me praying with him, he started bringing me to Jumu'ah. So I went to the masjid, the one I've been running away from for years. And of course, during Jumu'ah, the khatib is there on the member screaming his lungs out and telling you this and fear Allah and Yawmul Qiyamah and Jannah and Jannah. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, man, slow down. What is this? And so it started to hit me. I'm going to hell. I knew I was going to hell all along, but I was running away from it, running away from it. I don't want to think about it. But now it's being put in your face. I started saying to myself, if I die now, I know I'm going to hell. No doubt about it in my mind. I have nothing. So he said, you know, this is not good. Jumu'ah after Jumu'ah, I'm still not, I don't have enough iman to, to pray for Allah. In that stage, in that phase, Ramadan came. And when Ramadan came, you know the shayateen to suffered, the shayateen are chained, and the doors of Jannah are open. I said to myself, you know what? 
if I'm going to do this, I mean, if I'm going to pray in front of him, I might as well pray for real. And if I'm going to fast and pretend that I'm not eating, I might as well not eat for real. I mean, what do I have to lose? I'm, I'm doing it for sure, but I'm not being able to benefit. I'm, I can't benefit. I said, you know what? I put the niyyah, I'm going to actually pray for Allah and fast for Allah this Ramadan. As soon as Ramadan began, I fell into this one sin that, that ruined it for me. But it was means for me to say, to have a stronger determination to make up for it. I said, no, I'm going to make up for it. And so here you go. I'm fasting for the first time, legitimately for Allah, and I'm praying for Allah. When, we would, when Maghrib time would come, we would drive from where we were in, on Ventura Boulevard to a place called Anaheim. Those who are listening from there, they know what I'm talking about. There are Masjid al-Rahman and I don't know how many major masajid, big masajid in Anaheim. It's known for being a Muslim populated area in, in, in California. So we drive out there, he has a Jaguar, he's a fancy guy, got money and everything. We're driving over there and we're you know, talking on the way and whatever. We go to the actual masjid, we have iftar together. You know, I would usually break my fast on a cigarette, okay? Everybody will be eating, you know, tamar and sabusa. I'm puffing on a cigarette because I'm dying all day, I didn't smoke. And if you smoke, man, you know that stuff is bad. That stuff is bad. And so young shabab, never ever try that thing, man. Don't let the shaitan tell you, just try it so you can hate it more. No, you will not. It's a trick from the shaitan. Leave cigarettes alone and leave smokers. Don't be a secondhand smoker by hanging out smokers either. These people, they're bad. Ta'ban. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. See someone smoking, stop them. So, we pray taraweeh. And you can imagine taraweeh. I mean, at the end, if you have some heart, if you have something, you're going to be ashamed of yourself. And I'm listening to this Quran and things are starting to register and it's like, it's like I'm really reaching the point of, of internalizing the fact that I need to change my life because what I thought was, what I thought was success, what I thought was actually fun and happiness, Wallahi brought nothing but misery. And you will not know the ayah in the, in the book of Allah. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Until you, until, unless someone tells you, don't try it. Wallahi ضَنْكَ يعني, you, you say how? On the outside, you, you got the clothes, you got the thing, everything looks cool. How in the world are you suffering? Don't ask how. Allahu A'lam. Innama, the promise of Allah. When you go home and you're sitting in the bathtub, I, I wanted to kill myself. Outwardly, people think everything is fun. Inwardly, you're dying. That's why many of the rappers left the music industry alone and came back to Allah. Because they know. What I'm talking about, I know what they're talking about. You don't need to know that because you may go there and never come back. So, I'm starting to realize what's going on. Now imagine, we go back from Anaheim to our locality and he drops me off with the scums of the earth and guess what? They are the scums of the earth. We go to the house, pornography and ladies around and drugs and everything and I'm like, oh man. I was just in the house of Allah, listening to the Quran and the reminder, and now these are the shayateen of ins right in front of me. I actually did not like being with them anymore. I was disturbed from this whole environment. The next day I said, Hisham, I can't do this anymore. I can't stay with these guys, man. It's very bad environment. I moved. So I'm sitting there, I go on, on the internet, do whatever I do until I get sick and tired of doing whatever I was doing on the internet. Then I, there's nothing else to do. So I said, you know what? The guy has a bookshelf with a bunch of masahif, Quran. Why don't I read the Quran like everybody else? So I started reading the Quran. I've been listening to the Quran, I have not yet read the Quran. I'm praying and doing things, minimum requirement. As I read the Quran, I don't remember any particular surah or ayah that I read that kind of shook me, you know what I mean? But just reading the whole thing made me reach the conclusion that 
this Ramadan will be the change of my life. I'll have to make the change. And I strove to be a good Muslim until the end of Ramadan. Guys, as soon as Ramadan ended, it's like, it was like a dream. And I went back to everything I had left alone. The shayateen are back. And I don't have enough iman. But there was now a struggle. Before there was no struggle. I had surrendered completely to shayateen. Now, then, I said, there's a struggle. So, one day I would pray, one day I would smoke. One day I would you know, speak to certain people and the next day I would leave them alone. And I went through this really يعني, inner, internal struggle that, that cannot be described in words. Very difficult. <laughs> But the, the point is that Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Learn this lesson. Those who strive, you just make the effort with your weakness. If you make the effort, we shall surely guide them to the paths. I started struggling. I moved out from these guys with another guy without mentioning his nationality into his apartment, two bedroom apartment. One for me, one for him. Now, I'm in a very sensitive phase, okay? I'm trying to leave alone the haram, trying to do good, but I have a lot of jahiliya, a lot of jahiliya. So when I wanted to wash my, my clothes, I was too cheap and too lazy to buy my own detergent. I said, when the guy goes to work, he was a security guard, I will use his, you know, Tide, it wasn't Tide, it was some other brand, to wash my clothes. So I'm waiting for him, I'm sitting there, you know, watching TV, pretending nothing's happening, waiting for the guy to leave. As soon as he leaves, I go pick up my clothes in the basket, and I open the, the, the cupboard, and I get the, uh, whatchamacallit, and I get the, 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 some, some detergent, and I go, guess what? The guy was slick, man. He used to put that, that container in a particular way huh, to know if anyone used it. I thought no one would do this, man. I mean, we were cool guys. You know, everybody used everybody's stuff. So, but he didn't say anything. I thought, big deal. It's just detergent for the sake of Allah. Come on, man. So that happened. He didn't say anything. Things are coming along. I'm starting to get a little better, and I start liking the masjid. Okay, there was Masjid Rasida, not, far far, not too far from where I was living, and that became my place of comfort. That became the place of, of relaxation. I would go there often, try to pray there as much as possible, by Allah's tawfiq, of course, not because of me, and things were coming along. And we wind up meeting a, a brother from Syria, may Allah forgive us and forgive him, uh, who was the one who st started teaching us tajweed. But there was a lot of Sufism. We would, I remember we would be sitting in the morning, you know, in congregation. Asbahna wa asbah al mulku lillah, walhamdulillah. You know the adhkar? We will say them in unison with the moving of the head back and forth every morning. Together then we go to the donut shop and have coffee and whatever, whatever, whatever. طيب. Things are starting to get better in some way and they're getting worse with Hisham. Hisham, the nice guy, the one who did me favors. I was a lousy employee, just tell it to you from the end. It was my fault. I didn't want to work. I was too lazy, too passive, too whatever. And he wanted a hard worker. So we weren't getting along. And eventually I had to get fired from his job as well. And this is when I had met the guy named Talal. Talal had a bus. He had a what? A bus, which was his what? His home. He had a bus, like a school bus, but it was beige instead of yellow. He took out all the seats, huh? and he, would be, he used to sell wholesale. Wholesale pens, wholesale uh, notebooks, and you know, erasers, whatever, things like that. Stationary stuff. And so he had a love seat, like a sofa, at the end of the bus where he would sleep. 
And the rest of the bus is where he put his bada'a, his own you know, merchandise, and he would drive around and drop off his stuff at the different Muslim kind of you know, uh, stores and groceries and whatever. And I'm like, this is amazing, man. And you know, the, I already am I'm inclined towards this idea. One time I go home, and my roommate says, why did you go to my room and try to steal my money? I was like, what? He's like, there's a sock, there's a, a, one sock out of there on the ground in my room. And I lock my room. Why were you trying to rob me? I said, Ya Sheikh, why would I ever rob you? He said, you took the detergent before. I was like, oh, <laughs> busted. Now, try to explain to him that I didn't do it. He's not believing me. He's convinced that I stole before. So khalas, the, the shaitan told him, I, say, I remember, I got the Qur'an, Wallahi, Wallahi, I didn't go to your room. Look, it was detergent, man. I didn't think you would trip over some detergent. I know, I know I stole it, but I wasn't really stealing it. It was just using it from you. The guy's system shut down. You are this, and he started going to the masjid telling the people, this guy is a thief, this guy is ta'ban, this guy is like, Ya Shaykh, I'm trying to do things good in the masjid. Leave me alone, the guy, khalas. I said, you know what? I'm going to buy this bus and move out from, from, you know, from this place. And sure enough, I did. I bought this bus, which became my home. Therefore, I could be your neighbor anytime you want. You just call me, I'll drive my house right next to yours, park outside, and I'm your neighbor. And I became many people's neighbors back then. I'm living on the bus, wallahi, the best times of my life. The best times of my life. I got a membership at a fitness, uh, you know, gym, because I need a shower. Unless you don't shower. I needed a shower. Where am I going to shower? So I got a you know, membership at the gym. I would go work out, and then this is the place where I would shower. Denny's restaurants is open 24 hours, that's where I use the bathroom and eat. And Ralph's supermarket is open 24 hours, that's where I get my snacks. I got it all figured out. I got it all figured out. I'm living in the bus, ya jama'a, you won't believe. Yani, peace of mind, I have no rent to pay. Rent is very expensive over there. I was renting a one, bed, the one bedroom in the apartment for I think $800. How much is that in riyals? Around 3,000 something riyals. You pay this now for three months in your six bedroom apartment. Anywho, I'm having a blast. I'm by myself. I'm running away from, from all the things which I've been, you know, I'm, I'm starting to grow. My iman is starting to grow by Allah's grace. I'm leaving alone all kinds of stuff. And I move, I start working in a company in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, long distance phone calling and I was a telemarketer. I would call the, the Arabs in particularly because I was an Arab. I would call them and sell them long distance plans for people in Lebanon, Egypt, whatever they called. For lesser prices than AT&T and the ones that they offer there. And it was a good paying job. I think it was like $10 an hour. Double what I used to make with Hisham. I'm making money, I'm chilling. There's a masjid there, Vermont masjid. I would park my bus outside that masjid often or sometimes near work. And I would pray Fajr there. Now mind you, the bus which I had was very old, no license plates. I bought it from a guy who ripped me off actually. Long story, I'm going to skip it for, for good reasons. I, uh, the way I open my bus is with a cane. You know the cane that the old man uses? Okay, because there's no, there's no driver door. There's only the door where the students are supposed to, the passengers are supposed to get on the bus. The only way you can open it is with a handle. So I would have to open the window for the driver's seat, there's no door, and would extend the cane, and with the cane, grab the handle, and after maybe 20, 25 tries, finally be able to yank it for the door to open, then I get through my bus. So I would be walking at, you know, cold, it's very cold in the morning in Los Angeles, I have this big blanket over me, I have a cane, I'm like 25 years old, you know, it's like, what is this bum? He's this young bum walking down the street. And I would go to the masjid to lead people in salah. Well, I'm not supposed to lead them in salah, but there were only three people praying fajr. Look at the sad, look at the sad condition. Three people would come for salat al-fajr. The masjid is three times this hall. But they were all non-Arabs. And so the tendency is, if you're an Arab, you should lead the people in salah because supposedly you may have better pronunciation. I had learned some Quran, remember, so I wasn't that bad. 
So anyways, I, but I had forgotten, maybe I had maybe a few surahs memorized, I wasn't really trying to memorize the Quran. When they made me the Imam, I made it a point to start memorizing Juzu Amma again. I started to memorize Juzu Amma. I became their official Imam. Every morning, I put the cane on the side and you know, lead the people in Salah. Allahu Akbar, there were three people running behind me. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is the good days. Until I called my mom. Mom, good news. Khair ya mama. Khair inshallah. Mama ana sick in a bus. Shu? Because you don't know Lebanese dialect. Mama, I live on a bus. What? What? You live where? In a bus. In a bus? You crazy? They will kill you. I said, no, no, they can't. I got a big knife. You have a big knife? Not knife. You have a big knife? I said, yeah, no one, mom. In Los Angeles, you must be out of your mind. Mom, I'm, I'm trying to convince my mom that this is the best thing that happened to me. It is not working. My aunt, she's an atheist, FYI. The one that first welcomed me when I went from Lebanon to her house is an atheist. Her husband is on some other planet in terms of deen. I don't know what he considers himself. May Allah guide him. I had many problems with him eventually. You will see. So my mom, he, they moved to Texas. They went to Houston, they would move back, back and forth between Los Angeles and Houston, Texas. They had moved back to Texas while I went to New York and came back to Los Angeles. My mom said, Wajdi, al bas halla, and khal takshiri. Said, Mom, but you know, the bus, Mom, is the best thing that happened to me. He said, You sell the bus and you go to your aunt, Aunt Sherry. Her name is Sherry. And that's the last thing I wanted. But I can't say no to my mom. I knew that much. So I called her. Now, when they moved to Texas, this husband of hers had bought this big old mechanic shop and uh, body shop and storage lot, three in one, okay? Mechanic to fix cars, uh, body shop to fix cars with accidents and storage. When someone gets arrested, which happens all the time there, when the police arrest them, what do they do with their car? They send it to the storage lot and the storage lot will charge them like $10 a day until they are released from prison. Then they will pay the amount due and release their cars. So he had bought all these three. He's running the mechanic shop. I call her, say, listen, you know, I've changed. You know, I'm no longer the same old person. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ch I've changed. I'm, I'm, and I want to make things up. Okay, my mom said, you know, you have such bad reputation with them. Go back and show them your good side now. Okay, try to make up the, the, the errors. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I spoke to him. He said, look, man, you will be a slave for two years. Okay, your rent is paid because they had a big, big, a big house. Your food is paid, your salary is guaranteed, and I will let you work in the mechanic shop before I make you in charge of the storage lot. Don't ask me for anything. Don't tell me you want to go out, you want to see friends, you want to, don't, I don't want to hear anything from you. You need money, you're in a bad financial situation, come to me, work for two years, make money. You don't have to pay anything, you're only making, you're only making, get back on your feet, then do whatever you want. You want to stay, marhaban, welcome, you want to leave, that's your choice but make your mom happy. I said, deal. You will not hear of me anything that will make you upset. And I move, I sell the bus for a cheap price, I lost, and I go to uh, Houston, Texas once again. So now I'm in Houston, Texas, I'm a changed person. I start working with him in the mechanic shop. I'm the one who's supposed to clean the rags. That was my job. He didn't want to make me a mudir ala tool. He wanted to humiliate me in the beginning so that when I tell other people what to do, they will know that this person has been through the, the various stages. He didn't become a mudir. There's no wasta in, in that sense over there. So I'm cleaning and doing whatever, fixing kahwa, shai, everything, everything you can imagine. I'm a nice guy, okay? I'm not asking for anything. I'm quiet, you know, to myself and everything. Don't speak to anyone. And he would let me take the car at night when we'd finish to go pray Salatul Isha in the masjid and come back. That's it. Fajr, we would be at work. Fajr time, we would not have the time to, for me to go to the masjid. Things are smooth, ya shabab. I'm making money. I have a whole floor for me, two, two bedrooms. Everything I want is there. 
not paying anything, I'm making money, get, paying back my, you know, the, the, the debt I had to Hisham and many other people. Until one day, his relative from Jama'at al-Tabligh paid us a visit. Jama'at al-Tabligh, you know them? They came to the house, his relative. And they said, you know, come on, why don't you come? He doesn't pray, he doesn't know Allah, Udhu Billah, the guy is Allah, Allah, Yahdi, Yisalhu. They said, you know, come to the masjid. They started debating with them and telling them the people made it to the moon and you're still doing salah. And started giving them all this philosophy, Allah, Billah. They said, yani, let this guy come with us one day. On the weekend, let him come one day. He, would, he still had some modesty, shyness. He said, Yalla, one day let him go. It's a day off, let him go. <laughs> I go with them, going to Dallas. Now they, pull, they pulled the stunt. After we went to Dallas, huh? and we got there, he said, look man, we have to stay here for three days. I said, man, I have one day off, man. This guy is not playing games, okay? I need to go back. They said, we can't all go back because of you. I'll talk to him. I said, well, you talk to him, you talk to him. He calls him and says, look, we have to stay here for three days and we didn't have this plan, blah, blah, blah. He lost his mind because he was all about work. I go with Jama'at Tabligh for three days and uh, during our sessions, I remember, wallahi, I can remember right now even the people sitting next to me and uh, the Amir of them was an Arab. Unusual, unusual. But he was an Arab. And so he would give us the bayan after the salawat and everything. He wasn't really referring to Fadail Sadaqat as much. He would be more on Riyadh Salihin tip. But anyways, among the things which he mentioned, now mind you, I'm not praying Jumu'ah. Okay, I'm not praying Jumu'ah because the guy told me you're here to work. And I don't know the ruling. Okay, so I'm just taking it to pray the whole at the, at the, at the, at the, at the mechanic shop. Khalas. During the bayan, the guy mentioned a hadith that, you know, there's another hadith. Whoever abandons three Jumu'at, huh? then Allah will seal his heart. I was like, oh, ouch. That one hurts, man. I haven't been praying any Jumu'ah. That hadith got stuck in my mind. We finished a three-day ordeal, huh? And we went back. He's fed up with me. He's upset. I said, look, it's not my fault, man. These are your friends, your buddies, your relatives. I'm just a victim. But anyways, what had now entered my life? <coughs> Jumu'ah. So I said, look, I'm sorry for what had happened, but I, I want to pray Jumu'ah in the masjid. Because all your other friends, they're all tow truck drivers, tow truck drivers, they go, let me go with them. He said, no. I said, why not? He said, I told you two years of your life. Okay? Friday is working hours. It's working days, working hours. You can't go pray Jumu'ah, you stay at work. I'm like, look man, this is not fair. Okay? Everybody gets a one hour lunch break. The masjid was far. So it'll be an hour and a half, an extra half hour, big deal. Let me go. Mm -mm. My friend, this is not cool. Okay, three Jumu'at, I'll be in trouble. No way, Jose. I said, okay. First Jumu'at, I remember Wallah. The first Jumu'at, now that I know, I tried. I tried just before the time came. His friends, they told, I was dealing with his other friends. I said, look, talk to him. Maybe you can convince him. They tried to talk, talk him into it. Nothing, man. The guy was adamant. So they all drove right in front of me. Everybody's getting in the tow truck, going to Juma, and I'm standing like this, you know, with my one-piece uniform, you know, like the mechanics. I said, okay. I go and I pray, Lord, I'm crying in the office like I've never cried before. Why are these, how come I can't pray Juma? Why am I praying Lord in the office? What is this oppression? I hated the guy from the bottom of my heart. Before, I started liking him because he was being cool. He let me go pray Isha. Now I'm like, this is my enemy, man. The first Jum'ah I went by, I'm sad, I didn't get to pray, but now we have a conflict. We go back home, my aunt is over there, we start talking and you know, worse, we start going and said, you know, that's not fair, you're not letting me. He said, you know, why don't you go worship Allah, worship me? Hey, hey. I said, you know, I want to worship Allah on Jum'ah. I said, why you worship Allah, worship me? Allah, Allah, Allah. He's yani ta'ban. I said, ayywa. Okay, I know what kind of person you are now. Khalas. We're not going to last very long. I knew it. First Jumu'ah didn't let me go. Second Jumu'ah didn't let me go. And here comes the third Jumu'ah. I'm saying to myself, if I don't go today, I'm done. 
Allah will seal my heart. I will go back to the old ways. I don't want to go back to the old ways. I've learned my lesson. I'm going to pray istikhara. Okay? I didn't know the, the actual manner of pray, praying istikhara. Istikhara was like whatever. I prayed istikhara and I think I'm going to see a dream. Okay? Because that's what we learn. That's what we're taught. You're taught istikhara is a dream. You see a vision, you know the result. Some people attach colors. You see red, you know, you're going to be falling in love. You see blue, you're going to go to the skies. I don't know what they come up with. I said, okay, pray istikhara at night. And that morning was Friday morning. I wake up in the morning, Wallahi al-Azim. And Allah is my witness that these are not matters to lie about. You don't go to Jannah to make people happy or to entertain them. I wake up in the morning and there's an ayah that is playing in my mind. An ayah that keeps playing by itself. No MP3, no MP4, nothing. Just repeating. Guess what the ayah was? Those who have heard it, don't answer. Those who haven't heard it, guess. Guess what ayah my mind was automatically playing? Anyone? Anyone with a wild guess? Huh? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu idha nudi ala salati min yawmil jumu'a fas'au ila dhikrillah? No. Huh? From Juz Amma. Good question. From Juz Amma. Something that happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaqa. Khalaqa Al-Insanamin Alaqa. Iqra Wa Rabbuka Al-Akram. Al-Ladi Allama Bil-Qalam. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان لا يطغى أرآه استغنى إن إلى ربك رجعا أرأيت الذي ينهى عبدا إذا صلى أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى أرأيت إن كذب وتولى ألم يعلم بأن الله يرى كلا لئن لم ينته لنسفعا بالناصية ناصية كاذبة خاطئة فليدع نادية سندع الزبانية كلا لا تطعه واسجد وقترب The ayah was كلا لا تطعه واسجد وقترب I get the goosebumps No, do not obey him Prostrate and come closer I was like لا إله إلا الله Why is this ayah playing in my mind? I don't know But you know what? I'm praying Jumu'ah today I'm praying Jumu'ah, Wallahi, I'm praying Jumu'ah. At any cost, I'm praying Jumu'ah. Khalas, this was to me the istikhara, the answer from Allah. I go to work this morning. Now, mind you, now I'm at that stage, okay, I'm already starting to run the, the, the body shop. Because it was quickly, he made me go through the stages in a quick way just to be in the mudir. He doesn't want to put me in the mudir right away. So, because it was a Jewish guy who would trip, of course. Why is this guy the mudir? Because he's your relative. Tayyip. I go now, the, the, the body shop, no, I'm sorry, the, the storage lot opens its door for customers around 7, 30, 8 in the morning. The mechanic shop opens the earliest because people have to fix their car before they go to work. But because I live with him, we go in the same car. So I would go with him. He will open the mechanic shop. I would go to our storage lot just to sit there, to turn on the AC, turn on the computer, make the coffee, get things ready. We're not yet ready for customers because we open later. He is doing his thing in the mechanic shop. I'm doing my thing in the storage lot. Now, I have a brother who has asthma. Okay? And he had just entered the hospital in Lebanon because of that asthma. And there's something there called calling card. Okay? You buy it for like $10. And then you call a toll-free number, 800 number. Then you put in the number. Basically, when you use the phone, it doesn't charge the phone anything. Because 800 number is free. And you're using the credit on your mobile, if you want to call it. 
I'm sitting there in the office. I said, let me call my mom and check on my brother. I call my mom through the calling card. I'm speaking to her and this and that. While I'm on the phone, the, the, our line, the, the store starts blinking. Someone is calling. And am I supposed to answer or not? Not. It's not yet working hours. I'm there early. I'm not supposed to answer customers. We're not supposed to release cars until a particular time. I said, whatever. Khali. He's sitting in his office watching the phone ringing and no one answered in the phone. He sends the Jewish guy, say, go see what this guy is doing. Why doesn't he answer the phone? He went, he saw me on the phone. He went back, said he's speaking on the phone. The phone rang again. When it started ringing, I said, mom, it seems that there's something urgent. Someone keeps calling. Let me call you back later. I'm going to answer the phone right now. The second line, there's a second line. As soon as I'm saying this, okay, assalamu alaikum, about to hang up the phone, he walks in. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm speaking on the phone. He said, and why didn't you pick up the line? I said, I was with my mom on the phone because my brother's in the hospital, checking on him. He said, I don't care for you or your brother or your mother, hospital, no hospital, this is business. And did, as soon as he said these words, my mind shut down. He said, hey, you, uh, now you don't care about my brother in the hospital, you money worshiper? Now he's double my size. I try to beat him. Alhamdulillah, that wasn't as successful. We, I went, you know, tiny little guy, put my face next to his. We're ready to, we're ready to swing. We're ready to swing. Alhamdulillah, that didn't happen. I would have been knocked out. And the guy, the Jewish guy came and calmed us down and moved on Mafi Bishkila. I said, no way, no way I'm going to be able to work with this guy anymore. And he said, no way you're going to even spend the night in our house. You go back to Los Angeles tonight. And he took a couple of hours. He didn't speak to me. We were, you know, both upset. And he took me back to the house. When he went into the house, I went with him. He started fighting with my aunt. This nephew of yours is a bastard. How could you bring this guy again into our lives? They almost got divorced because of me again. Before it was because of my craziness. Now it's because I want to pray. Jumu'ah. He said, Wallahi, he will not sleep in our house tonight. And this guy will book him the next ticket back to Los Angeles. I, won't, I don't want to see his face ever again. Blah, blah, blah. I am my ner I'm having a nervous breakdown. I, my mind shut down. I don't even remember Salah. I'm sitting there like, what happened? What happened? My atheist aunt doesn't even believe in Allah and His Messenger. Said, didn't you do all this problem because you wanted to pray Jumu'ah? Said, yes. Said, so take the car and go pray Jumu'ah because you're leaving anyways. I said, oh yeah, I had forgotten about Jumu'ah. All this is for Jumu'ah and I had forgotten about Jumu'ah because of the nature of the confrontation. So my aunt, the atheist, gave me her Grand Cherokee. I remember the car. And I drove to the masjid. I couldn't believe I was sitting in the masjid looking at the khatib. It was the third, no, was it the third Jumu'ah, but I'm in the masjid. Anyways, I said, this is Fatih from Allah. And sure, I don't think they found a booking for the same night. The next day, I flew back to Los Angeles. Now, I go back, I call my mom, say, Mom, you know, here's what happened and this and that. My mom became upset with me. I said, but Abshiri, it's going to be good inshallah. What happened was from Allah. The istikhara was from Allah. This ayah was from Allah. Don't worry. I go back over there. I call Hisham. And Hisham now, he's missed me. And he wants to, uh, you know, reconcile. He says, come back and I will give you, I will increase you a dollar. Please don't. I will increase you a dollar in the salary. I said, okay. I call my uncle. Say, listen, I'm back. Not that they were very, but now... They weren't as sad as before because they know that, you know, I have had some change. He I said, you know, he said, my son, his name is Jonathan. He, uh, he has a Toyota Celica, 1984. I remember it. I'm about to sell it. Do you want it? I said, of course I want it. He said, you can take it, give me the payment whenever you have money. The guy whom I was living with, huh? The guy who accused me of robbery and I wound up leaving him, living in the bus. The whole time he was trying to find someone to live with him, he couldn't. So when I came back and called him, I said, so what? You know, is there still place? He said, look, come back. There's no way. Because he's paying $800 out of his pocket because he can't find someone to rent the room. So in one day, I got my old job back with more money. And I have a car, which I wasn't expecting. And I'm I have a place to live.
I said, you know, this is it. I called my mom and said, Alhamdulillah, everything is getting good. And really things started getting good from that moment on. Quickly now. Okay, I'm back in, in, in Los Angeles, but now I'm a different person. I'm a changed person. I go to the masjid, I frequent the masjid and everything. During this time, now I will tell you later. During this time, I had stopped speaking to women completely which I advise every young man to do, and every young lady to do. Don't talk and communicate with the other gender, because it will open doors that you want to keep closed. And there's so much you can control when the shaitan is there the whole time. Things may begin a certain way and have a huge turn. So leave that communication. That will save you a lot of headache, trust me. I'm at that stage now. Okay, I'm back with Hisham. I'm going to the masjid all the time. I love the masjid. We're having, alhamdulillah, everything is good. Learn tajweed, you know, idgham and iqlab and ikhfa and idhar and shqalqala, things which I had never known before. Alhamdulillah. And uh, basically, this group of people moved to a business next to ours. Among them are some ladies. One of these ladies would frequent our office because Hisham was the one who showed them the place. He, he actually, the one who brought them to this building, he hooked, up, he hooked them up with the, with the owner and everything, the landlord. And, uh, so they, and he had sold them insurance from before, so they had good relationship. So when this lady, you know, these ladies started frequenting, I'm, I'm Mr. You know, don't talk to me now, okay? Ladies, shh, out. I don't, I erase all the numbers from my phone, nothing. Khalas, me and the female gender are at war. It's difficult over there, but that's what I had to do. So anyways, this, this lady kept asking for advice because she had come from another country and her legal situation was very similar to mine. And she kept asking for advice and I'm like, you know, I'm all frowning, say, look, I, I don't talk to ladies, you know. And really, I don't have any advice to give you either. I know one thing though. My life was busted until I started practicing Islam and then that solved my problems. If you want, that's the only thing I can offer you as advice. Don't ask for anything else. She said, okay, sure. I said, okay, good. So I start telling her about Islam. Mind you, wallahi, I don't know what the word aqidah means. If you say aqidah, I say, what is aqidah? Math, zero, zero. Only memorize these few surahs and tajweed only. But I would, you know, sit there and, and you know, use the, the, the actual fitra. How could Allah have a son? You know, she was a Christian, Catholic Christian. No way Allah has a son. Allah doesn't have any children. Just basic stuff. And I started telling the people in the masjid, the brothers, I'm giving da'wah to this, you know, one lady and everything. This, so they start giving me material. Huh? Take this CD, give her this DVD, give her this book, and I would just, here, you know, here. So I, and I didn't think anything would happen, and one day she says, I want to become a Muslim. I was like, oh, this is serious. She wants to embrace Islam. We speak to the brother, Brother Mundir, who was the one who taught us Tajweed, said, look, the lady wants to embrace Islam. He said, bring her. I remember he has a Suburban, GMC. We go sit in the car. She's sitting in the back, I'm sitting next to him. And he tells her the story of Ibrahim. With, you know, Hadha Rabbi, with the Qamar and the Shams and whatever. And he gives her a nice little story and then he makes her declare the Shahada. She repeats the Shahada after him and the lady is a Muslim now. Alhamdulillah. And so... Uh, Things are getting, you know, we're happy. There's something happening. Now we need to find her a lady who can teach her wudu and salah because a man cannot do that. I mean, you can give her a book and DVD, but you can't be teaching her salah. Huh? Make sure, brother, you don't try to find, you know, a non-Muslim say, let me show you how to make wudu. <laughs> do you see that? It doesn't work this way. Okay, because the shaitan is going to take you to something other than wudu. Anywho. So let's find a lady, some sister who, you know, is nice, nice sister at the masjid. We couldn't find anyone. Couldn't find a sister who could speak English and educate this young lady about salah. So, <laughs> I'm sitting with the brothers after Fajr, and one of the brothers says, so how is the new Muslim? I said, she's all right. Said, have you found someone to teach her? Said, no. He said, why don't you marry her? I was like, what? 
Mary, the last thing on my mind was marriage. I'm barely getting back on my feet, okay? I'm living in an apartment, in a bedroom, in someone's apartment, not even mine, not even my name. No fulus to get married, really. i barely still paying my debt. The last thing on my mind is, is marriage, the last thing. But the idea just registered, you know? So that's worth considering, you know? Because that was initially there. So I called and said, listen, I got something very important to talk to you about. I said, okay. And so I'm thinking now, of course, how foolish I am. I'm thinking like back in the Jahiliya, you know? You know, slick and everything, smooth operator. It's going to be smooth. So I said, listen, lady, you know, I think we should get married. She's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what? You know, how, hey, you know, how could you? <clears throat> you know, come on. She was like, get out of here. And she was like, she was, I thought that, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, she probably likes me and everything. And turned out that lady has no idea what I'm talking about. And she was really sincere. I'm like, and so it was a major, major yeah, a shock for me. Disappointment, you could say. But I was a stubborn one. So anyway, she rejected us. I forget about this. It's not about me, no. Marriage is not on the list of things that we can consider. And don't, but then I kept insisting. And every time I would, you know, talk to her, I'd give her maw'idha. You know, this dunya is... It's not important, and what is important is the life to come. Eventually, somehow, Allah, you know, convinced her that, you know, this is something that can be done. Now, her parents are Catholic Christians, and the situation is not very good. She embraced Islam, and she finally said, yes. I called my parents, said, I'm getting married. They're like, what? And, but they were so happy that I've changed, you know, and things are getting good. The last thing they wanted to do was kind of, you know, disappoint me. Otherwise, you know, your parents want to be there for your marriage, and they're all the way there. My father said, you know, whatever makes you happy, you know, go ahead and do it. I said, okay, fantastic. So we go, and we speak to Mundir, we're going to have the marriage contract. I don't, got, I don't have any money, no dowry, no nothing. I remember I went to the supermarket, got some Oreo cookies, some Pepsi, and some milk. And we went to Mundir's house, he brought the brothers, made some tea and some cake. And you know, she came and the Egyptian brothers, there were a bunch of Egyptians who were soldiers who would come to the States to have a course. And they came for the marriage and the dowry was, I teach her whatever I know of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, just to show you the mercy of Allah. Now you would think this would never happen, this happened. And it could happen to you and better than that. So I get married and I don't have any means to get married. Nothing to offer. We finally, I moved jobs another time to work at a furniture store with Hisham. Another Hisham, Hisham al Barbari. That was Hisham al Zain, that's Hisham al Barbari. Regency furniture. We rent a small apartment. It was so small that the bed used to be in the wall. It's one, one room, studio. The bathroom and the kitchen and the room are all one room, and the, the, the actual bed will be in the wall. You open the closet and the bed will fall down. And when you. When you want to wake up, you, took, you put the bed back because there's no room. Very tiny place. Um, during this time, I'm going to Jumu'ah and Masjid Risida. And after Salah, we're standing outside. After Jumu'ah. One brother is walking by giving out flyers. He stops. He looks at me. He's like, Joe? My name was Joe, by the way. Sorry. Every Muhammad there is Mo. You want more, man? No, I don't want any more. The, the people have the tendency to be ashamed of their Muslim names. So Muhammad is Mo, and you know, uh, Jihad is Joe, and the list goes on. Wajdi Joe. There was some relation with the J sound. So I'm Joe. He said, I know you. I said, Where do you know me from? Where does he know me from? During the Buddhist times, with the Buddhist rappers, one time we were in the temple, the Buddhist temple, writing a song about peace, promoting peace, because there were all these events in the terrorism. And I was one of the rappers. Now, the Buddhist temple had invited representatives from Christianity, from Islam, from different religions, to have a, a conference where every speaker will speak about how their religion is pro-peace. And that brother was the one who was supposed to represent the Muslims. His name is Khalid. And when he was hanging out with the people, he saw that I was among the rappers sitting there writing a song. 
And he started talking to me, he said, you're an Arab? I said, yeah, I'm Lebanese. He said, what in the world are you doing here? What are you doing with Buddhists writing rap songs? I said, I'm a Buddhist. And I'm a rapper. What's the big deal? And he, he, was, he thought there was something odd. So now, some years later, he sees me where? In the masjid. Outside the masjid, he said, you. You, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean? He said, didn't I not meet you before? And you know, with the Buddhists, I was like, oh, shh. Be quiet, man. Give me the flyer. I'll tell you the story later. I'll tell you later. Don't burn me out in front of the people. Nobody knows. He's like, I got it, you know, give me your number. We exchange numbers. I'm supposed to tell him the story. I promised him. He went his own way. He would call me often. Every other week, say, huh, can we meet now? I want to hear your story. I said, look, man, I'm busy, busy, busy. One time he calls me, says, look, now you have to come. I said, why? It was late at night. He said, a, a relative of mine who is a student of knowledge in Medina University has come. And I really want you to meet him. And he's in Saudi Arabia. Now, during that time, my mom and dad had divorced in Lebanon. And my mother came to Saudi here. Okay? And she was working for a princess. Okay? That was her situation. I said, good, I get to find out what Saudi's like, what my mother would be going through. And you know, well, it may be benefit of meeting this guy. I go and meet this guy, his name is Ahmed, Habibi Ahmed. The nicest beard you will ever see in your life. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Multicolor, big beard, like maybe seven different colors. It's amazing, amazing person. Anyways, you look scary to me in the beginning because um, I used to shave here and I only had a little bit, you know, trying to grow some beard. Anyways, I told him my story. And he was like blown out. He's like, what the heck is this? This is pretty crazy, man. I said, yeah, so that's what it is. He said, look, I'll strike a deal with you. Because he would go spend the time in, in, in the States during the summer vacation when they finished their school. He said, every morning, because I was attached to the masjid, he said, you pick me up with your car. He doesn't have a car. You pick me up with your car. I go pray with you the salawat, and then we'll get to know each other. I said, okay, that sounds good. Every day I would pick him up for Fajr, even Fajr, way early in the morning, drive all the way there, up the hill. They lived in a big castle in the mountain. Their relatives were pretty rich. And I would pick him up, we spent time in the masjid. Now, I'm Sufi, without really wanting to be Sufi, but everything I do is like Sufi based, more or less. So I remember I'm sitting with him in the masjid, and he says to me, he says to me, read the Quran. And I said, okay. I start reading. He said, why are you, why are you, you know, rocking back and forth? I said, why not? He said, this is like the Jews, man. The Jews do this in front of the wall, you know, the, or something, or the Sufis. I said, okay, man. It's difficult to read the Quran without rocking back and forth. I mean, I've been doing it all. I've been doing the adhkar with, with rocking back and forth, let alone the Quran. So I finished recitation. Sadaqallahu al He said, what is that? I said, what? He said, Akhi, where is Sadaqallahu al I said, whoa, come on. Rocking? No. Now this one? Everybody does it, ya akhi, Abdul Basid, I started naming all the Qurra which I've heard, everybody does it. All of these people are lost, and you know, I'm thinking this guy is nuts, man. He said, I'm telling you, did the Messenger of Allah do it? I said, I don't know whether he did it or not, but I'm sure there's a reason for it. He said, if you don't know why, you can't do it. You have to have an evidence. This guy started giving, you know, it's like, what is this man? Everything I'm doing is wrong. To this guy, everything I do is this wrong, wrong, but he's nice, he's wise, he's not really burning me out. He's slick, very slick, mashallah. He started giving me books. He gave me this one book about Sufism and different things. He, he saw the orientation I had, the people I was hanging out with. Anyways, at some point in time, he mentioned something about Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. And I was like, ah, I've heard that name before. Let me go look it up online. I go look it up online, and we have the Wahhabis. I said, Aywa, I'm gonna go back to the back in the days. This guy's trying to lead me astray, it's a Wahhabi. I go to the Imam of Masjid Rasida, who's an Ash'ari, Mu'tazili, Sufi. The guy is the furthest you can be from the right aqidah and manhaj. Huh? I tell him, This guy, man, you know, he gave me some, some stuff about Muhammad al Wahhab. He said, Muhammad al Wahhab, good. Go with the guy. I said, that's the most knowledgeable person. That's the Imam of the Masjid. He gave me the go signal. I'm with it. And I start spending time with ease with Ahmed. Ahmed starts teaching me this is this, this is that. Give me some books and whatever. Before he goes back, he tells me there's a Masjid called Masjid Al-Mu'min. Huh? On St. Andrew Street. Make sure you go there. 
Make sure you go there. Okay. Now, I am the dumbest person when it comes to directions. You put me behind the wheel and you tell me to go straight, I will somehow make a U-turn and get lost. I don't know how. Until today, by the way, even, even here. So every time I would make an attempt to make it to the masjid, I would fail. It's difficult to find and I would wind up praying in Vermont or some other masjid out in that area. Because I knew where Vermont was, remember? Anyways, finally, one day I actually made it to the masjid. I made it to the masjid, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. I thought I was in another country. The brother was calling the adhan outside. He was standing outside. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And I told you someone's phone's on. Uh, ladies with niqab and gloves, brothers with shimag, you know, going, I'm saying, what is this? What are these, where do these people come from? Because you go to the other masajid, everybody's westernized. Everybody's westernized. You can't tell what he is, what... These people are hardcore, man. I'm like, this is wild. And I go in there. I remember, masjid is, is the masjid was a house. It was a house that they turned into a masjid. Two floors. Two, two, two stories. I'm sitting in the masjid looking around these people. It's just so weird. Everybody's this. Everybody looks like he's from the Sahaba, right? And, uh, you know, the Imam Shaykhna, Habibna Abu Mujahid Farid Abdullah, Hafizahullah, he comes on the minbar, you know, nice, you know, nice, neat and everything. And he says, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmadu wa nasa Then he switches to English. All oh, praises due to Allah. He's like, oh, what is this guy, man? Is he an Arab or what is, what is this? The guy was bilingual, fluent. Never seen something like that before. Besides Ahmed, of course. So I'm amazed at this guy. He gives the most beneficial khutbah I've ever heard. I actually benefited from the khutbah. We go outside, there's a brother who actually lives in Jeddah now. Oh no, he, yeah, he still lives in Jeddah. He's selling books outside. He's selling books. And I'm in the mood. I wanted to buy my first Islamic book. I, my eyes fall on a book called Al Aqeed al Wasitiyya, the Sheikh Al Sabi bin Taymiyyah, with the Sharaf Sheikh bin Uthaymiyyah, the green one, the one that so I have right now. The Sheikh teaches this book every Wednesday uh, between Maghrib and Isha. I'm like, oh, really? He said, yes. The place is far, by the way. I don't live near there. I live in somewhere in. in uh, uh, what is it called again? Pasadena, Glendale, and this other place. I forgot now what it's called. Ala uh, hal. I said, okay, I'm going to start attending the class. I go back, tell my wife, look, they have good news. This is a book. And there's a sheikh, amazing sheikh, gives the nicest khutbah in the world. And he is teaching his book. And we start frequenting this masjid. Subhanallah, we find a peace of mind in the masjid. Turn out that he has classes and other than the aqidah. Jumu'ah, he would deal with the book of Aqidah Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, Sheikh Sheikh Fuzan, Hafizahullah, the books of fiqh. We started doing the Ajrumiya. My heart now, this masjid is my life. And I would drive every day, almost every day, half an hour to 45 minutes to attend the dars. I'm not willing to lose the dars. I would be sick. And my wife would tell me, relax. Take it easy, I said, I cannot, my mind cannot accept that the Shaykh has given the dars while I'm sitting at home. La wallah. And I would get up and I would go. So anyways, I was really يعني, fascinated with the Shaykh's classes and Allah decreed that we stayed learning from him. Until... Then we listened to a tape by Shaykh Albani about the obligation of hijrah, migration. You have to migrate from the land of Kufur. We listened to the tape and we said, oh man, we gotta go. I have a son now. Musab. So we decided we want to do hijrah. I'm Lebanese. Where am I going to go? Lebanon. We try to go to Lebanon. We start arranging going to Lebanon. I want to leave. I want to leave this environment. This environment is filthy. You can't really be a good Muslim uh, in the ultimate sense. Too much fitna around you. We wanted to go to Lebanon. We had some civil war between the Shia and the Sunnis. Lebanon was canceled out. What's next in line? Saudi. My mother is here. I start speaking to Ahmad Ahmad, you know, what are the means for me to come? He said, well, you need to have some, some degree, some certificate, something to teach, man. You know, I could try to get you a, a job as an English teacher, but you have to have something. And I said, okay, I'll take a course. I'll take a course to teach English as a second language. Not a big deal. And I enroll in a course. So now my plan is to come to Saudi. I'm communicating with my mom. My mom works for a princess. And my mom is very shy. She doesn't want to ask the princess for any favors, even though she can do us a big favor. So one day, the princess says to my mom, why is your son living in the States anyways? Why don't you bring him here to Jeddah and put him near you? So you can visit him on the weekend. It's good to have a family member. My mom is like, yes. 
be my guest. And next thing you know, out of nowhere, the last thing we would expect, we have visas, three visas. Mind you, I'm of a nationality, my wife is of a nationality, and my son born there is of a different nationality. So we're like the United Nations at home. So the United Nations gets uh, three visas, and we come to Saudi, I don't have a job. I'm not here on a job, I'm here just by a hookup. Wasta, huh? the wasta begins, it reaches you all the way there, alhamdulillah. We come here and I eventually go into the education field and start teaching English and just to give you, make long story short. One day after I'm living in Hay Rauda, I go outside the Masjid, Masjid Tawheed, and I see a van parked there that says Jadda Da'wa Center. I was like, wow, there's a Da'wa Center. I had no idea that there will be something like that. I know there are students in Medina University. I don't know there are places where Da'wa is given. So I'm sitting there reading the thing and uh, Brother Ali Lomanog, Filipino brother comes out, says, hey, Salam alaikum, alaikum salam. Said, What is this? He said, it's a, You speak English? Said, Yes, I speak English. Said, It's a van. We're a Dawah center. You have to come. Come and, you know, every Friday we have classes and everything. I said, Man, it's fantastic. We exchange numbers and, you know, I'm going about my business. Every Friday I say, I will go. Then, you know, the brothers at the local masjid say, Come to Tawfiq al Sayyid, come to this. They took me to different masjid. Eventually, I said, Let me call. I call him Thursday night. Say, I'm ready to go with you tomorrow. He said, why would you want to go tomorrow? We have a lecture tonight at Saudi German Hospital with Dr. Yahya Al-Bahir. You want us to pick you up? I said, sure. So they picked me up and I go with them and I see Dr. Yahya is giving a talk in English. Qasas uh, Al-Anbiya, Stories of the Prophets. And I'm looking around me, all these people learning in English. Man, this is amazing. There's da'wah going on in English. So the next day, I go with them to Ju for, for the da'wah center in the morning. Now, the da'wah center has a program. You go, pray. Ouch. Malish. You gave pro Jumu'ah, almost there. You go pray Jumu'ah, and after Jumu'ah, there's a khutbah translation. So we go back to the uh, room, the class, and they were myself and some other Saudi brother. So they said, We prayed in different masajid. They said, Each one of you do the translation of his masjid. Give us a brief. So he gave his, and I gave mine. Said the Imam spoke about this and about this. Anyways, for whatever reason, they liked it. They said, You know, Every Friday you do the khutbah translation. I said, okay, I have no problem with that. So I started volunteering every Friday with the Dawah Center. And when you hook up with the Filipino community, you become one of them. Okay? They're very loving and welcoming people, alhamdulillah. So I became one of them. We go to Mecca, go to Medina. We, we built some bond. One time when we came back, from, after we came back from Medina, one of our brothers uh, he had to go back to the Philippines permanently on an exit visa. So they have a habit, the Filipinos, they must have a farewell, you know, get together at the Corniche. So we all went to the Corniche to give him farewell. And then during the farewell, everybody gave a two minute talk, uh, you know, advising the brother and showing the feelings. So my turn came and, you know, I, I had a different view than everybody else. Because everybody was like, we're going to miss you and we need you here and try to come back and everything. And then uh, I, I, I knew that his family were all Christians. I said, you know, guys, you got to leave this guy alone. You know, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. He should protect his family first. His wife, children are non-Muslims. Let him go. Give him da'wah. Alhamdulillah, we got brothers here. Who was there, the director of the da'wah center? He didn't know me yet. Because I'm going volunteering on Friday. He doesn't come on Friday. He liked me. He talked to me after the, the, the get together. He said, look, I have a workshop for da'wah. Would you be interested in working with me on building it, developing it, and, and having it? I said, yeah, no problem, but I'm working in the school. He said, don't worry, we'll have the driver bring you to pick you up. We arranged the whole thing. I started working with the Dawa Center. I left the school, and they offered me a full-time job. And once I got into the Dawa Center, my whole life changed. Because now, by Allah's grace, I was immersed in Dawa. Review this uh, pamphlet, and read this book, and give this lecture. And so that's the whole thing. And that's, that's what my advice, my advice comes. Uh, brothers, immerse yourself in, in, in that which you're good at. So that you can excel. Okay? Fi sabilillah. I'm not talking about dunya things. But each one may have a gift in something that will serve Islam. Give it the due time. Give it the required time. Invest, invest in it. Because that was the old English and all that wasn't really, it was old street language by the way. The da'wah English didn't happen except in Saudi. The English pertaining to da'wah 
only took place in Saudi, not anywhere else. It was very basic in the beginning. So that immersion brought about, you know, what we have seen in the last few years by Allah's grace and mercy of da'wah and of lectures. Of course, I still strive to attend the classes of the shuyukh and to benefit from the mashayikh and to stay in touch with them despite the fact that some people claim otherwise or may deny things which they are not aware of. No, we have not reached perfection. No, we have a long way to go. And no, we all struggle together to please Allah. I remain to be a helpy slave of Allah. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enable me to service His deen until I die. And, and the same goes for you, inshallah. Well, you shouldn't say inshallah when you make dua. The same goes for you. I ask Allah to make that a, a reality. Um, basically, what is the lesson? The lesson is Allah is more merciful to you than your mother. Who would have thought that from all the darkness and all the problems and all the drugs and all the misguidance and all the Buddhism that this will happen? Who would have thought? No one including me. Not my parents, not my relatives, no one. Everybody thought I was going to die in some evil way, including myself. But Allah Azza wa Jal is merciful, ya ikhwan. So don't despair from the mercy of Allah. And don't stop striving. And don't give up. It's a long journey, but it's short. Long in a sense, short in a sense, because you struggle for these few years, and when you meet Allah, you will be paid your wages in full. In full. Now, we may not get what we think we deserve, but on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, يُوَفُّونَ يُوَفَّونَ أُجُورَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَاسْ فَقَدْ فَاسْ So this is all coming, hang in there, and remember the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is vast and, and available. We need to seek it. We need to seek it. Another advice for the shabab, be careful of being fascinated with the western lifestyle, and be careful of being fascinated with living there. Okay? Things appear a certain way. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, there are people who go in, in one level of Iman and they return with the same level. And there are those who go misguided and then Allah guides them. And there are those who go guided and then they go astray. You cannot guarantee that you are the, the first. You cannot guarantee that Allah will not lead you astray. And if you were to do so, you have fallen into the trap already because you have done tazkiyah of self. You have already praised yourself. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa used to beg Allah to keep his heart firm on Islam. So who is one of us to say, no brother, I can go there, I'll manage, I'll be okay, come back. No Habibi. You can go astray in no time and it's beyond your ability and capability. So be careful of that. Be careful of being fascinated with the Western lifestyle and living in the West. Stick to the teachings of Islam, adhere to them. This is the rope of Allah that will bring you salvation in this life and in the life to come. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. A'udhu billahi ila shaytan al-rajim. قل الحمد لله وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى الله خير أما أم يشركون أمن خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل لكم من السماء ماء فأنبتنا به فأنبتنا به حدائق ذات بهجة ما كان لكم أن تنبتوا شجرها فإله مع الله بل هم قوم يعدلون أمن جعل الأرض قرارا وجعل خلالها أنهارا وجعل لها رواسي وجعل لها رواسي وجعل بين البحرين حاجزا فإله مع الله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء ويجعلكم خلفاء الأرض أإله مع الله 
قليلا ما تذكرون أمن يحديكم في ظلمات البر والبحر ومن يغسل الرياح بشرا بين يدي رحمته أإله مع الله فعال الله عما يشركون أمن يبدأ الخلق ثم يعيده ومن يرزقكم من السماء والأرض فإله مع الله قل هاتوا برهانكم إن كنتم صادقين